welcome. We are here at St. Jude's Church to tell you a little bit about the parish history, the church, the building, and the school that goes along with it. My name is Mike LaCrosse. And I am Norman McDonald. St. Jude's Church was founded in October of 1949. The parish was created to accommodate the needs of the growing Catholic community here in Waltham, which was caused in part by the post-World War II development of the Warrendale and Rangeley Acres areas of the city and a large number of people living in the bleachery section of the city. Along with the new homes in Waltham, the parish drew parishioners from their former parishes of St. Mary's in Waltham, St. Luke's in Belmont, and St. Patrick's in Watertown. The first pastor was the Reverend Edmund J. Haynes. Father Haynes did not stay at St. Jude's for very long because of poor health, and consequently is not well remembered. But he did celebrate the first mass in the new parish on October 28th, 1949, the Feast of St. Jude. The Mass was celebrated in the Teresian Hospital at 147 Main Street, the location of the St. Jude's Church today. Today, Father William Leonard, who also has the responsibility of ministering to the Fernal Development Center, leads our parish. Uh, okay, I'm Father Bill Leonard. I'm a pastor at St. Jude's Parish here in Waltham and also serve as part-time chaplain at the Fernal Development Center. Uh, I've been here for four and a half years now. I'm uh, the sixth pastor uh, among uh, numerous priests who have served here. Um, historically, perhaps uh, one of the first things that strikes me in uh, more of, uh, say, the last uh, 20 years is uh, both the involvement of uh, permanent deacons in ministry in the church and by far, especially in terms of numbers, uh, the great number of uh, lay people uh, involved in ministries. Uh, the first uh, uh, say 30 years of the church, uh, the ministries were generally conducted by uh, the pastor and priest assistants as well as the sisters who uh, taught in the school. Uh, but there's been a tremendous change in uh, that type of ministry in the church throughout the Archdiocese, in fact, uh, throughout the United States and certainly uh, very likely throughout the uh, Western world. Um, but uh, my presence here uh, was uh, stimulated by the fact that uh, there was a shortage of priests and at the same time um, the Fernald Center uh, abuts, literally abuts, the property uh, of uh, St. Jude Parish. And so uh, with a proposal that uh, uh, to try to save and share uh, the energies of uh, um, one priest, myself, uh, they, um, uh, di the Diocese of Boston agreed with a proposal that I serve here as pastor and also at the same time uh, served as part-time chaplain at St. Uh, uh, rather at the uh, Fernald Center. Uh, that certainly would never have been possible these four and a half years uh, without those two pieces that I mentioned earlier. Uh, one, the fact that there's uh, uh, a permanent deacon who has been here for uh, at least 12 years now, uh, who does much of the ministry that a priest uh, in the past days might have done, where one assigned here. And the second is uh, the involvement of lay people in ministries. Just as an example, in this one small parish we counted up every Christmas time, uh, there are 120 people literally 120 people who are involved in various aspects of ministry in the church, uh, ranging anywhere from uh, a deacon uh, to lay people, uh, being Eucharistic ministers or visiting the sick, uh, a group of volunteers uh, who help out at the Bristol Lodge in preparing food and serving the poor, St. Vincent de Paul Society, the uh, parish council, uh, lectors who read in church, ushers groups, uh, um, altar servers. There's just such an enormous uh, involvement of lay people actively participating in the church uh, through ministries of various kinds. So uh, it's uh, been challenging in terms of combining two ministries, but even at that, uh, there is a laywoman now who uh, does very much of the, uh, the bulk of the day-to-day -day, uh, ministries at the Fernald Center. And responsibilities primarily at the Fernald Center right now uh, for uh, masses, uh, a mass on every Sunday, every weekend, uh, as well as uh, funerals with an aging population of people uh, and uh, ministries to some uh, that are uh, not mobile to be able to make it to the chapel there. 
Um, again, uh, those two factors of lay people in ministry as well as a deacon here that uh, stabilizes the ministries that happen here. Uh, for myself, that's really been a, uh, uh, a remarkable development in the church over the years. Uh, in some ways, they talk about the shortage of priests as, uh, uh, as being a negative, and in some ways it is, but uh, on the other hand, after the Second Vatican Council, there's just been a, a tremendous uh, uh, growth and flowering of lay people who are committed to and involved in the ministries of parishes throughout the diocese. And as I say, in this one small parish, 120 people is, is quite astounding. Uh, add to that the whole uh, ministries of uh, religious education uh, from the uh, school. Sister Catherine has been the principal for uh, more than 22 years. Uh, and Sister Margaret, who is uh, recently retired, um, as well as many lay people who now teach at the school. And then uh, the religious education program with more than 300 students between uh, kindergarten and 10th grade uh, who are involved in community service and who are being taught by um, many parents in the parish as teachers in the religious education program. So that's kind of, for me, uh, a broad sweep or a scope or a broad uh, uh, brush stroke at what happens nowadays in a parish uh, that has existed since uh, 1948 up to the present time. Uh, one other major undertaking that has thrust us backwards in history, in a sense, is to know that oftentimes when one stands in a church, uh, you have a sense or a data uh, that tells you it was built maybe 100, 150 years ago even. This particular church having been built uh, uh, in 1950. Uh, shows that just in 57 years you have people who are still alive who actually founded this and many funerals that uh, are done in this uh, church are people who were uh, among the original founders. And so after that 57 years, like any house, any building, uh, there's been need of a great number of repairs. And two things there are striking. One is that uh, there is an entire building committee of people and a fundraising committee who have now raised close to $200,000 to accomplish that. In the doing of that, in this generation, we're always thrust back to the first generation of people uh, raising their families, settling in this community, uh, who first established and built, literally built, this church. Uh, so it's rather humbling, uh, and even more humbling is that uh, many of those people, when they die, uh, have bequeathed money for the care of the church uh, in their wills. So uh, even after death, they still have an effect on this very building and the stability of the parish and parishioners, uh, but even more so, uh, a humbling inspiration to those of us who try to, uh, uh, to bring it uh, back to life again and to do the obvious repairs uh, that happen after 57 years, uh, from the spire down to the, uh, uh, down to the foundation, literally, is what is being taken on uh, these past two years with one more year to go to complete the project. So for myself, that's uh, how I uh, uh, have found and uh, uh, fell in love with and uh, am very much uh, inspired by what happens here in the church and ministry at St. Jude's in Waltham. Thank you. The site of the church on Main Street was the former site of the Theresian Hospital that many older residents of the city of Waltham remember actually being born there. The old hospital is uh, now the new rectory of St. Jude's and sits on Boca Road. Boca Road is directly behind the church. There have obviously been a number of changes to the building, but most noticeably it is now connected to the back of the church. Many of the early parishioners remember attending Mass sitting on folding chairs at the Wall Street Fire Station back in the late 40s and the early 50s. The church, uh, the fire station was used as a site of worship while St. Jude's Church was being built. On October 10, 1951, the Reverend Daniel McCabe replaced Father Haynes who had done much of the architectural planning of the church. Father McCabe, for those who don't know him, is the McCabe in the Monsignor McCabe field of the Warrendale Little League. The naming of the field by the city of Waltham is an indication of how much he was loved and respected by both his parishioners 
and the rest of the city and community. Monsignor McCabe was a very humble and priestly man who served St. Jude's until December of 1968 when he retired at the age of 75. Father McCable was actually credited for the construction of the church, which was dedicated on March 29th of 1952 by Archbishop Richard Cushing. Archbishop Cushing reminded those in attendance, the next, next to their homes, the next dearest home was the church, which shares in our lives from birth to death. True to Father Haynes' plan, the only departure from the colonial style of the church was the pediment over the front of the church, which bears the insignia of St. Jude's, the golden Grecian wreath symbolizing immortality, and closes the instrument by which St. Jude, one of the twelve apostles, met his death in Persia. Today the church is undergoing some much-needed renovations under the direction of Father Leonard. During the 60s and 70s, St. Jude's was a very active and vibrant parish. There were five Masses every Sunday morning, and if you were not on time for Mass, you didn't get a seat. In fact, two of those Masses were at 11.30, one in the upstairs church and one in the downstairs church. During those years, two other priests beside the pastor usually staffed St. Jude's. There was an act of ladies' sodality, a men's holy name society, and a Catholic youth organization. The church held shows, communion breakfast, bazaars, and other parish-wide activities. In 1964, St. Jude's Parish was purchased, purchased two more lots almost contiguous to the rest of the property and broke the ground of our elementary school. The elementary school was staffed by the Sisters of Notre Dame de Mor and was in part filling a need created by the closing of St. Joseph's Elementary School and later St. Pierre's. In the fall of 1968, the school opened with 75 students, and it had an active um, parent organization, the Friends of St. Jude School. The church also purchased the house on the corner of Brigham Road and Main Street to serve as the convent, and later replaced it, replaced it with Dr. Cutler's house on the corner of Main Street and Broca Road. Hello, my name is Sister Catherine, and I represent St. Jude School in the capacity of principal. St. Jude School is a small, Catholic school associated with St. Jude Parish in the Warrendale section of Waltham. St. Jude School is fully accredited with the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. There are classes for children in kindergarten through grade eight. On September 5th will be the 42nd year of St. Jude School's founding. It was fully staffed by the Sisters of Notre Dame de Nemours, whose foundress was Julie Billiard, who founded the Order for the Education of the Youth. At this time, the staff includes Sisters of Notre Dame, Dominican Sisters, and very dedicated lay men and women. Today I have with me Kathleen McLaughlin, who is going to enter grade five in September, and Michael Della Russo, who will be part of the class of 2008. Our goal is to have students enter to learn and leave, leave to serve. At St. Jude School, all strive to adhere to the mission statement by developing every student's self-worth and respecting the uniqueness of all peoples. The School Advisory Board and the Friends of St. Jude, or the PTA, are a vital part of the standard of St. Jude School. Students at all grade levels participate in a variety of daily learning experiences. St. Jude School is a Catholic school and therefore, religion is a part of every student's day. The curriculum is basic, and there are great emphasis put on reading and mathematics, not to make light of the other disciplines. In addition to the core curriculum, the schedule includes expanded programs in computer, art, music, Spanish, 
physical education. We are blessed with a state-of-the-art science room and library. The students participate and take an active role in preparing the liturgy for First Friday Mass, as well as many Masses on other special occasions during the school year. As an expression of their living faith and belief in the good God, the students reach out to many community projects, such as the Bristol Lodge, the Marist Hill Nursing Home, the Fernal Center, and the Relay for Life. Within the school community, the older students devote their time and talent to the younger students in such ways as the Buddy Program, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and the Christmas Concert, to name a few. During Catholic Schools Week, all participate in a theme-based activity. Some activities are recreational and others are more academic. Open pray that the students of St. Jude School will continue to develop as young adults who can effectively spread the good news of the Lord in their lives in an ever-changing world. In December of 1968, the Reverend Jeremiah Collins replaced the retiring Monsignor McCabe. Monsignor McCabe was known to comment with pride on the strong financial status of the school and church at the time of his retirement. We are sure he was equally proud of the spiritual legacy that he left St. Jude's. He was a wonderful spiritual leader. Father Collins served St. Jude's until passing away in January of 1982. It was under Father Collins that the parish council began and the CYO became an active part of parish life. He also purchased the current convent and presided over many repairs and renovations to the church. In 1974, Father Collins was proud to host the Silver Jubilee celebration of the parish at the Chateau de Ville in Framingham. After Father Collins' retirement in 1981, he was succeeded by Father John Jennings, a native of, Mayo, of County Mayo, Ireland. Father Jennings welcomed our first deacon to the church, Lou de Bonfiglio. Deacon Lou, as he was quickly known, became a part of the fabric of the parish life and added vitality in the spirit of Vatican II and the parish. Deacon Lou served St. Jude's Parish for the next 10 years. The role of deacon in the church has become increasingly more significant today. Deacon Al Santosuazo ably fills that role. Deacons are called to charitable ministry. The stole, such as this ordinary time stole, is worn by the deacon as a symbol of service. It represents a towel that might have been wrapped around the waist of Jesus when he was serving the others. By virtue of baptism, all are called to serve, that is, to minister to others. Jesus tells us that what is done in his name for the least members of society is done to the Lord himself. All clergy well understand this pastoral call to God's service. They take on this role following the example of Jesus. We do not consider a deacon a bit less than a priest, nor do we say that lay persons are not called to serve the people of God. Deacons serve as a reminder of God's love for his family, that is, a visible presence of God's love for his family. Today, due to the decreasing number of priests available, deacons and lay ministers are importantly significant. Deacons baptize, witness the sacrament of marriage, preside at funerals, wake and grave graveside services, some specialize in prison ministry, bringing communion to the homebound and visiting the sick and comforting the bereaved. Many ministries need not to be considered solely the role of bishop, priest, or deacon. They can be well served by all bapti baptized lay persons. The role of deacon and lay ministers has become vital for the life of the church today. Priests alone cannot carry on Jesus' mission to bring God's love to the world. Father Jennings also presided over the 40th anniversary celebration of the parish in November of 1989. And after his retirement, he felt so connected to St. Jude's that he came back to celebrate his own 50th anniversary of ordination.
The Reverend Daniel Bowen replaced Father Jennings at St. Jude's in January of 1990. Father Bowen did not experience good health while at St. Jude's and was replaced in September of 1992 by the Reverend Robert Waldron. By this time, only one priest, who was greatly assisted by the deacons, staffed the church. The days of two and three priests are no more, and the participation of the laity has become more important to the well-being of the church. Hence, development of parish councils to advise the pastor and the administration of the church are more significant. Hello, my name is Richard Drexler, and I'm co-chairperson of the Parish Pastoral Council of St. Jude's. The other chairperson is Father William Leonard, who's our pastor. The council is a group which consists of lay people in the parish and parish staff, and they share in the pastoral care of the parish. These members include the parish deacon, parish financial manager, the head of the parish religious education program, and the principal of the parish school, as well as the lay minister of the Fernal Development Center. The council does not make any decision and has no authority over the St. Jude School. There is a school board specifically for this purpose. The council usually meets on the third Sunday of the month at about 6.30 and the normal meeting is over on or before 8 o'clock. Any parishioner may attend and participate in the meeting, but are not allowed to vote on an issue discussed by the council. They can, however, bring up any issue at the meeting, and they're welcome and encouraged to voice their opinion of any item being discussed. I usually talk to Father Bill and George Fabiano, who helps coordinate our agendas, about two weeks before the committee meets. At that point, an agenda is set up for the meeting, and once agreed upon, it is emailed to all the members of the committee. If for some reason an item cannot be discussed in the normal time frame, the committee can decide to continue the meeting or table the discussion until the next meeting. Minutes of the meetings are kept and a short version is posted at the back of the church. A full version is emailed to all members for verification and approval at the next meeting. The date and time of each council meeting is published in the church bulletin almost weekly. The vote on an issue is a statement of position by the council. The pastor is under no obligation to adhere to the council's opinion, but he seeks and values this advice and wisdom from parishioners and staff. There are procedures that can be followed if the council and the pastor disagrees, but this has been totally unnecessary. Father Leonard has always cooperated strongly and encourages the council to make its opinions known. He wants the communities to be active and will fully discuss any issue with the council and will let them know his reasons for either being for an issue or against an issue. Each member of the council serves three years. They can then decide if they would like to serve for an additional three years. When a position becomes open, a notification will be published in the church bulletin or an announcement will be made from the pulpit. There are also two youth members who are full members of the council. One will be in the 11th grade and one will be in the 12th. One is elected each year for the confirmation class, and that will fulfill the coming year's 11th grade, and the current 11th grader will move on to the 12th grade. One of the successes has been the formation of a finance committee. They meet every three months during the year and make a presentation to the council in the fall. Once approved by the council, a financial report is then published in the bulletin. There are four lay members of this committee that all have a financial background. The church financial manager and the pastor attend these meetings as well. One of the pilot programs currently being undertaken is the coffee hour greeting program. On the Sunday of the parish council meeting, there is a coffee hour between 8.30 and 10.30 mass. Members of the council greet parishioners as they enter the church. And the purpose of this is to help establish friendships throughout the parish as well as listening to whatever concerns parishioners may have. We are in the middle of a church renovation project. There are two subcommittees that are set up for this. One is the building fund committee that is comprised of council members, and the other committee is the building committee. The building committee is comprised of trade people who not only have planned the re renovations, but have also donated their skills to these improvements. To date, both aspects of this have been very successful. During Father Walder's tenure, the property between the school and the church was purchased, a dream of Monsignor McCabe. 
and turned into a parking lot for the church. It also resulted in a handicap entrance being created directly from the parking lot into the church and the creation of a true campus for the parish with all the property connected. In 1999, Father Walden oversaw the parish celebration of its Golden Jubilee with a dinner and dance at Lantana's in Randolph and a mass celebrated by Bishop Emilio S. Aluve for deceased members of the parish. There was also a reception at the school for those who could not attend the dinner dance. Father Leonard joined the parish in 2002 and continues as our spiritual leader today while also ministering to the needs of the residents of the Fernal Development Center. Among other efforts, Father Bill has recently undertaken an ambitious renovation of some parts of the church that have deteriorated over the years. To many of those who worship at St. Jude's, it is like an extension of our family. We received the sacraments here, were married here, our children were baptized here, and family members were buried from here. In the words of then Archbishop Cushing in 1952, St. Jude's is our dearest home next to home. Yet we must always remember, church is the parishioners. The building is simply where we meet. Let's take a quick tour of the church and see this beautiful example of colonial architecture. The 30 rows of benches that fill the body of the church are reminiscent, though not replicas, of many of the other colonial churches in the diocese. These two also bear reminders in the form of brass plaques of the families who sacrificed to build the church. As you wander through St. Jude's Church, you will notice that virtually everything, statues, podiums, chairs, etc., bears one of these commemorative brass plaques. As you look at the outside walls of the church, you will see the beautiful Stations of the Cross, carved stations that are mounted all around the body of the church. Again, a feature of a colonial church that simply fits into the integrity of the architecture of St. Jude's Church to make it a more comfortable place to be. Perhaps most impressive to someone who has experienced the changes in church liturgy in past years is the altar. Consistent with the church practice, the altar was repositioned so that the priest now faces the congregation, much like I am right now. St. Jude's Parish made those changes tastefully and did not disrupt the architectural integrity of the building. The altar of St. Jude's still sits under a beautiful wooden canopy held up by pillars and maintained the colonial style of the church. Behind and beside the altar are the same raised panels used on the side walls of the body of the church. The communion rail donated by the family of Monsignor Joseph Burke, a diocesan priest, Waltham native, and a longtime friend of Monsignor McGabe, has been removed and is now used in St. Jude Hall. The main tabernacle now sits on the left of the altar and two side altars. Years ago, it was common to see a priest saying Mass or a Eucharist being displayed or venerated on one of these side altars. The church originally had four side doors, and with the addition of the handicap entrance, one was changed to allow for direct access to the church from the parking lot. At the same time, the beautiful baptism, baptismal that resided in the section of the church was removed to make room for a new door. Also, benches were removed from the back of the church to allow for move, move, more movement gathering space. Benches were also removed from the middle of the church to allow for movement worshipers at communion time. Here we are looking at the uh, beautiful choir loft of the original uh, church where Mike and I uh, started our presentation a little bit earlier today. On the front is a uh, clock, uh, very ornately uh, decorated uh, in gold. But more significantly are the uh, columns and so forth that indicate the uh, woodwork around the choir loft, maintaining the colonial tradition of the church. The current organ is now located in the front of the church as the change of the liturgy in the last few years has uh, resulted in most churches moving their uh, organ to another section of the church and doing away with the old choir lofts. Thank you. In recent years, the confessionals were enlarged as well, also as a result of changes in church practice. 
But again, the parishioners of St. Jude's can be proud that the original decor of the church was maintained and the confessionals show little sign that they are not original. As you can see, this confessional is designed to look exactly as the other two confessionals in the church that were original to the church. But as we open the door, we now allow for face-to-face, -face, as we refer to it, confession with the priest, and uh, we have an uh, appropriate place to have that uh, sacrament uh, experienced. The most important element is the people who comprise the congregation. The parishioners of St. Jude should be extremely proud of the things that they do and have accomplished. At the front of the church are two posters talking about the church of Father Joe Donfrey in Nigeria. The people of St. Jude's Church dedicate what we refer to as the Fifth Sunday Collection to Father Joe Donfrey's parish in Africa. And as a result, Father Joe has referred to one of his churches, because he is responsible for many, as St. Jude's Church. He also has a St. Jude's Computer Center at his complex in Africa. And it was all made possible by the donations and the sacrifices of the families that built this church and the families that are now building a church community with Father Joe in Africa. That just about concludes our tour of St. Jude's Church. Once again, my name is Michael Cross, and I'd like to thank you for joining us here on our look back at St. Jude's and tour. And I am Norman McDonald, and I hope that uh, you found this little tour informative. We enjoyed doing it for you. And we wish to encourage anyone in the community who would like to come and visit St. Jude's Church who has never been here before, or maybe someone who hasn't been here in a long time, to come and join us for any of our worship services, or at any time just visit the church and uh, say hello. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon.